wouldn't have happened if not for this. I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do without the help and support of the woman I love. And that wouldn't have happened without something that went on here, half a world away, Baltimore, Maryland. Two epic royal love stories tied together by a fading piece of history, something that wound up hidden in the hood. The problem in uh, 1936, when the king wanted to marry Mrs. Simpson, was the fact that he was head of the Church of England, which did not recognize the remarriage of divorced people. And he was aware that at the coronation, he would take the coronation oath, which would have effectively prevented him from marrying Mrs. Simpson because he would have to swear at the coronation service to uphold the traditions of the, of the Church of England, which, as I say, forbade the remarriage of divorced persons. The fact is, it wasn't, Mrs. Simpson wasn't unsuitable because she was American. She was unsuitable because she had two husbands living and that's what the British government wouldn't accept. And it's also what the colonial governments wouldn't accept, i.e. the governments of Canada, uh, India, Australia, and uh, New Zealand, and the various other uh, uh, countries of the empire, all of whom had to be consulted. Bill, here we are right next to Wallace Warfield's home practically, and you've erected this wonderful museum in her honor. But what frustrates you about most Baltimoreans, and people in general, who know or don't know about the Duchess of Windsor. They don't have a clue. King Edward VIII gave up the throne to marry this woman. It was amazing that it was huge news then. It was an enormous news. It was in the papers all the time. Afterwards, you know, they were, they were constantly in the papers. They were, uh, she was the best dressed woman in the world. They were fashion icons. They went everywhere. They knew all the famous people in the world. They lived fascinating lives, but yet people in Baltimore don't have any clue who she was. Mm -hmm. They just don't know. It's just amazing. Alexandra, other than making the King of England give up his throne for her, what was Wallace, the Duchess of Windsor, also known for? Well, she was certainly known as a fashion icon of the 20th century, and I think it was justified. She had a, a very specific style. She patronized some of the top designers of the day. Uh -huh. um, this example is known as the monkey dress, and this was a dress that she probably wore once. It was designed by Givenchy just mm -hmm. for her, and it's made of a silk organza, and then embroidered, all hand embroidered with a, a monkey band. So each of the monkeys is playing a different instrument. And this is a play on the German porcelain monkey bands, which I suspect that she had seen either mm -hmm. owned by the Duke or in one of the houses she was in. And it custom made for her, there is no other monkey dress. It came to us through one of her uh, friends and relatives in outside of Baltimore and delivered right to the museum. So we also have a wonderful photograph of her wearing it done by a Baltimore photographer. So there's a great Baltimore connection to this dress as well. How do you feel about the fact that most people in this neighborhood, let alone the city, most people don't even know who she was? Well, they don't even know who she was or, or even where she lived. But then again, I hear stories that she lived everywhere, all over the place. That's just not true. She, there were very specific places where she lived and 212 Biddle was one of those places which is three doors away. The only reason we had this museum was to enhance the house to raise money for charity. And I would say most of the people on this street, with the exception of a couple of renters that I don't know, they know. They know where she lived and they know all about her. Well, it sounds like he also gave up his uh, fortune for her as well with all these beautiful designer dresses. I think he was very supportive of her mm -hmm. fashionista tendencies because he himself had a great interest in costume. And I think they probably made an effort to coordinate some of their, uh, their attire when they had public appearances because you can see that in the photos. Mm -hmm. And he paid just as much attention to his clothing as, as she paid to hers. In fact, in the collection we have designs by Christian Dior where they would be done uniquely mm -hmm. uh, for her. And this is the height of couture where mm -hmm. she would get various swatches and she could decide exactly how she wanted the dresses made. So it must have been really lovely to wear only couture 
clothing for your entire life. I feel so shabby here. No. <laughs> well, she was really petite. I yes. mean, look at this waist size. What is this, like 20 some inches? This is about 25 inches. So much smaller than the average woman today. She was a very religious dieter. That's how he could afford these dresses. Mm -hmm. Low grocery bill. <laughs> and would she have worn this at a cocktail party or entertaining or? Probably a, a somewhat formal event. I mean, this is a fairly formal gown mm -hmm. and she wore it with an enormous pile of aquamarines around her neck. So it was, it was quite formal. This is, uh, this dress by Christian Dior is much more typical of what she would have worn just mm -hmm. in her everyday mm -hmm. um, about town clothing and yet yeah, still made just for her um, down to every detail and uh, something that we were able to acquire that shows more of what she wore every day as opposed to what she would wear for special occasions. Mm -hmm. And how did the museum get these pieces? This was delivered by a friend and, and someone distant relation to us, delivered to us in the 60s. Mm -hmm. But the other parts of the collection were donated to us through a foundation when the Sotheby's sale happened. And because of Wallace Simpson's connection to Baltimore, they felt it was important that we be able to represent her story and her clothing is a great way to represent certainly her story after she married the Duke. All the publicity lately with the King's speech, the royal wedding, all of this has brought her back to light. She did get a lot of attention when, uh, after she died, when her jewelry bought, brought in like $50 million at Geneva uh, Sotheby's. And then the last fall in Sotheby's London, uh, whoever bought uh, jewelry at that auction 25 years ago, that stuff brought in a record amount of money. Just one, one piece of her, uh, the Panther diamond and onyx bracelet has been so copied in everything, all kinds of jewelry. It brought over seven million dollars. Do you have uh, shows or displays about her on and off? Or? We have had an exhibit about her mm -hmm. that featured her fashion and incorporated mm -hmm. loans from other collections as well. It was a sizable exhibit. We've just done an event with a British author who's written a book about her where we brought some of her clothing out for the public to see. Every possible slur has been attached to her name, including uh, a general impression, I think, that the British public would have had in 1936 and probably even to this day, that she was virtually a prostitute from the corner of the block, as it's known in Baltimore, or, you know, like the street corner, however you like to put it. This, of course, was absolutely untrue, and, and, and she and Mrs. Merriman, her aunt, were very upset about it uh, at the time, the kind of description of the family, because the Warfields uh, can trace their ancestry right back to England. In fact, they come from... Warfield in Berkshire, not terribly far away from Windsor. And they were a very early uh, founding family, and they went over and they were empire builders. Um, her family, um, you can trace back to founder Knights of the Garter, the Earl of Devon, back to Edward I and the Plantagenets, and really as far as you like. Now, the, 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 the Edward VIII did descend from them too, uh, of course, um, but it's very interesting to find her descending from them um, through the Wyatts and various other other uh, links. I mean, a lot of people did, a lot of people do, mm -hmm. but she certainly did. And it's great fun to find her descended from uh, the second Earl of Devon because he was a founder, Knight of the Garter, created by Edward III, with a stall in St. George's Chapel, where, as I, as I say, she, she, she uh, attended the funeral of her husband and then later her own funeral was held. And she was definitely born a Warfield, into the Warfield clan in Baltimore, but, um, once her parents, her father died, her circumstances, financial circumstances changed significantly. And, her, and I think that she always sort of was, regretted that and, and wanted a different storyline. Looking at uh, who Mrs. Simpson was and, uh, as a person marrying into the royal family, marrying a royal duke, uh, Alistair Forbes certainly thought that she, her ancestry was uh, probably rather better than that of the young Duchess of Kent and the young Duchess of Gloucester, two royal duchesses who married in the 60s and 70s into the family, and probably also uh, a, a, of a higher class, if you like, than the Jeromes who produced Lady Randolph Churchill, uh, the Kellys who produced Princess Grace of Monaco, and uh, the Bouviers who produced uh, Jackie Kennedy. 
I think it would be fair to say that the Warfields uh, uh, were a, uh, a better respected family than, than, than any of those three, which doesn't mean that they weren't respected too, but certainly she was from a better family. Well, Baltimore's Mount Vernon is definitely the Mayfair. Uh, it's the place of the, the wonderful hotels, the lavish homes. Uh, in 1914, it would have been the street of theaters, uh, fine, fine residences, uh, at the north end of the neighborhood, a train station. At the south end, the lovely squares, uh, the monument to George Washington. Uh, it's wonderful surround designed by Robert Mills. Uh, the homes of the grandees of the city all right there. Well, Mount Vernon Square at the time was the heart of Baltimore wealth. Uh, anyone who, who, who was anyone of the day, uh, moneyed or uh, political, uh, presence uh, lived in and around Mount Vernon Square. The industrial city is far away. Mount Vernon is a kind of a little remote. Uh, it knows nothing of the steam whistles and the factories and the port. Uh, very quiet. You would have just heard the uh, clip-clop of horses in the street on the uh, paving stones. People would frequent uh, of, 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 uh, of, of note, such as President uh, Wilson, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, William Howard Taft, H.L. Uh, Mencken, uh, William Jennings Bryan, uh, Elihu Root, uh, uh, the, uh, the Garrett family, uh, Hutton family, all those who were uh, anyone of, of uh, of import in that era, uh, would frequent Mount Vernon Square, would uh, would be involved in in in, uh, in events in some of the private homes there, the Marburgs, uh, all living around Mount Vernon Square. Uh, my grandfather lived there as well, uh, Mayor James H. Preston. Spotlessly clean, very well groomed, uh, door brasses shined, windows washed. Uh, Quite, quite the spot in Baltimore, the place where the, where the postcard photographers would go to make pretty pictures. If you wanted, say, a smaller place, or maybe you were a widow, or just did not have the uh, financial fortitude to take on a big uh, four-floor city house, there was the neighborhood afforded you marvelous secondary housing, and uh, very proper, very good, and in 1914, the apartment houses were coming on strong. Um, maybe we borrowed the apartment from the French. I've heard that. Uh, but builders and architects were turning them out so that you could have a, a flat of your own, maybe seven or eight rooms for the winter, and then go to your summer house, um, close it down, put white sheets over the furniture, leave, come back, uh, after the heat had uh, dropped somewhat in September. People who had uh, some economic uh, provenance uh, would have homes on Mount Vernon Square, uh, either on Monument or Charles Street or in the immediate area. Uh, homes, homes, uh, the Garrett family, uh, the Hutton family, uh, uh, my grandfather, Mayor Preston, uh, uh, I don't think there were any ex-presidents that lived there, but uh, certainly uh, the people of wealth uh, had homes in that area, more so than any other part of Baltimore City. Biddle Street, Preston, the northern streets of the neighborhood um, were quite good socially. Uh, the houses just were not quite as big as those facing the Washington Monument on the square or along St. Paul and Charles. So Tom, here we are on the 200th block of East Biddle Street, mm -hmm. the home of Wallace Warfield, a little girl who grew up to become the infamous Mrs. Simpson, the very woman a king gave up his throne for. Can you believe it? 212 East Biddle Street, amongst all these regular row houses, is the home of the woman who became the Duchess of Windsor and who brought down a king. It's very unremarkable to look at it. It's just a plain door and no historic plaque commemorating her birthplace or where she lived. Uh, You're absolutely right. In fact, it's been renovated over and over again as apartments. 
They've just come through with them already. Uh, you want to care to have a look? Sure. Okay. Scott, it's totally empty in here. That's right. It's been renovated several times. But you know, back during the abdication crisis in 36, mm -hmm. the people who own this house were actually giving tours of it. In fact, they were even getting people to sit in the bathtub for souvenir photographs. Wow. Your bath awaits you, Your Majesty. So when Wallace came to Oldfields, um, her uncle had brought her to the school. And I think his intention for her was to have a place to be and to be cared for, to get sort of this nurturing feeling of family and to have uh, the ability to be finished off with mm -hmm. some manners and uh, etiquette, but also to take advantage of uh, the German that we were teaching then, back then, and um, some of the science classes that were offered, mm -hmm. and to just to just have a place where she could be cared for. Alice and Wallace Warfield were both in the same class at Oldfields, and I think although Wallace couldn't afford to to make her debut, or she wasn't properly sponsored, uh, she did attend. Uh, Alice's debut, my, my and Alice Carrington, Alice Preston Carrington's debut in 1914. Oldfields definitely had a reputation back there of, uh, back then, as being a, a school that was private and um, uh, was a sanctuary for girls to um, come and be educated and to have a, a finishing experience on manners. There really wasn't even a um, a diploma back then. You came and you came and took your courses and learned your manners and um, had a proper upbringing and education and um, that we were we were a little bit of a, of a finishing school. I, I think that when Wallace's uncle sent her to Oldfields it was his intention that she would come to this school for a proper education and that she would have the ability to learn her manners and be set for society and to have that finishing um, component to going out into the world and having lovely manners and have that polished reputation and um, experience of how to behave um, properly in, in society. She was presented at the Bachelor's Cotillion at the debutante party in ball in Baltimore, and I don't know what year it was, as I was, as my daughter was, but in her era, it had significant meaning. Um, you found a husband there. That was the goal. You were presented to society, you found a husband. I mean, it's still very much a tradition within Baltimore, but it's, uh, and was it very important in her, during her era, I would say it's less so now, but nonetheless a tradition still upheld by many people of Baltimore. Wallace, I guess in today's, um, today's world, would be considered a little bit of a, of a mean girl. She um, was uh, mischievous and liked to um, cause a little bit of controversy um, in and amongst her friends. Um, she would, you know, be the gal outside on the um, fire escape smoking a cigarette after hours and um, she'd be the girl that was at dances and try to um, see if she could steal some of her friends' boyfriends away from them. And um, I've heard little stories about how she'd be at these parties and she'd friend all of the boys and have them sort of milling around her and giving her all this attention that she craved. And then maybe in the, in the background would be you know, dissing her girlfriends, so to speak, you know, to be um, taking, taking the boys away from, from her friends. And this is the Maryland Club. It was and is the bastion of male society right here in Baltimore. My grandfather, James H. Preston, was uh, mayor of Baltimore from 1911 to 1919 and uh, was mainly responsible for the modernization of the city of Baltimore. Wallace and Mary Bond, Alice's sister, were very close, and uh, Mary Bond was probably six years Wallace's junior and Alice's junior. 
and uh, Wallace was very envious of Baltimore society, very wanting to get involved, and uh, was a bit pushed out because she didn't have the funding or the sponsorship necessary. So, so she was always trying to get involved. Anyway, she uh, had talked Mary into uh, going into the Maryland Club, which is which was a male club, and causing a scene. Uh, kind of a thumb in your nose, if you will, at Baltimore society. But they planned it for several weeks, as I understand, and the story was told to me by, by my Aunt Alice. Wallace Warfield Simpson got in a lot of trouble here for dressing like a man. Dressing like a man, why? That's right, because you see, it's for men only, mm -hmm. and she knew to get inside, she had to dress up like a man. And she just wanted to crash the place. That's right, and she actually coaxed the mayor's daughter to dress up with her. The two of them were caught and thrown out. And uh, why Mary would have gone along with this, I do not know. Uh, she obviously did not do so voluntarily, uh, but I think that w Wallace somehow talked her into it. Uh, I don't know the context of how that happened, but I do know they went in there. They went to the bar. Uh, well, they first went to the door of the club and somehow got past a doorman who was there. And this was all in the papers of the day too, by the way. Um, and made it into the back of the club. And at the time, in the Maryland Club, the bar was in the rear. And they made it all the way to the back of the club and were sufficiently camouflaged to be accepted as men and were served, were served at the bar. Shortly after, uh, I think the bartender discovered that, that there was a fraud going on and uh, showed the two of them the door. And the next day in the newspaper, it read, Mayor's daughter and friend shown door at the Maryland Club. Wow, scandalous. Very. She had some cojones. Oh yeah, the same kind of nerve that it took, really, to face a king of England, absolutely. And almost cause a constitutional crisis. Exactly. Baltimore is a town where we admire bloodlines. And uh, certainly uh, in the uh, early 20th century, the social column of the, the Sun and the Old News and American was read as intensely as the news columns. And of course, the following day, I think this happened on a Saturday, but it might have been on a Sunday or Monday, in the, uh, on the, head, the headline of the Baltimore News American uh, for that day said, uh, the mayor's daughter and friend shown door at the Maryland Club. And of course, that was the ultimate embarrassment for the family. Even people who were not in the social register would read of the doings of Mrs. So-and-so and who was at tea and who was off to Bar Harbor and who was off to Florida. Uh, these were given a great deal of attention in newspapers uh, in the in Baltimore. In Maryland, you have to be very careful what you say about anybody because you could be related to them and you often are. So, And no one knew at the time that the friend was, well, they, they knew it was Wallace Warfield, but Wallace Warfield meant nothing back then at that time. But that was the embarrassment. Uh, I have worked in papers for almost 40 years and remember the great society editors of the day and uh, remember even uh, my own parents uh, reading the social notes. Um, we respected it. Uh, even if you were not of that class, you still sort of knew who the people were and stepped back from them. You know, Tom, this church is very significant. It used to be called Christ Church, and this is the site of her first marriage, which ultimately meant also her first divorce. It was an Episcopal church and certainly the center of society, but not anymore. Uh, it, you'll notice it's changed with the neighborhood. Here in Maryland, she was definitely a Warfield, and we, she was proud of that. She was proud to be a Warfield. But when she divorced both of her husbands, it was frowned upon by her long extended family here as it was sort of a, an uncommon practice at that during that time unacceptable practice because i think the true story is extremely interesting and it, endless discussion can be had as to what were her motives 
with the king, what were his motives towards her. I'm fairly certain that I'm right in saying that he wanted to go, he didn't want to be king, and that she was fascinated by him and obviously deeply flattered by the whole thing, and, uh, and then would have liked to escape. I think that's pretty much what happened. She was tragically sad. She, she wanted to be, have a, have a sophisticated, chic life with the prince. And, it, and, and with the abdication, it spiraled out of control. She, she could no longer have the obscurity and the fun that they had. They were having fun until the abdication. I think they were having fun. They were in love or appeared to be in love. And she, I don't think, had thought through the end game of what was going to happen. As, as nowadays people do. I mean, I think she just wanted a certain lifestyle that she felt she was denied her as a child. And she was gonna get it come hell or high water. Um, after that, of course, it must be very difficult for her. And he, of course, remained totally obsessed and devoted to her till the, his dying day. I mean, her Swiss secretary told me that, you know, wasn't it wonderful when the Duke um, that the Duchess was getting a hairdresser, that she'd come down the stairs and the Duke would come down the lift to see her into the car, off she'd go. When she came back, there he'd be on the front doorstep waiting to greet the car uh, and uh, escort her back into the house. And I thought to myself, well, in theory it's wonderful, but in practice it's actually ghastly. I and mean, if you want a Spaniel, buy one, don't marry one. To have somebody following you around. And apparently, you know, he was always insecure and always thinking she was going to leave him. And, sort of dreading something awful was going to happen. I mean, it would have been terrible if she died before him from his point of view. Although it was equally terrible what happened to her later on by outliving him by 14 years. Hmm. Well, Wallace actually followed in a bit of a tradition of marrying very well. Uh, Charles Carroll of Carrollton's granddaughters went right overseas and uh, married into the finest families of, of England. And then Betsy Patterson comes along and marries uh, Napoleon's brother. The royal family, some of them do give interviews now, but certainly they didn't in the past. You will find no interviews with the Queen Mother, certainly none with George VI or any of that generation. They absolutely didn't do it. But the Windsors, because they were to some extent cast adrift and because they were here in the United States, they did give interviews. They talked to Ed Murray. They, 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 he appeared in his film, The King's Story. They, they were very keen to put their point of view across to the media. So uh, in that sense, also, they were, they were trendsetters and they were ahead of their time. Um, and I suppose that the, the, the style of Mrs. Simpson as Duchess of Windsor actually, funnily enough, very much was mentioned at the time of the recent royal wedding that they said that some of Kate Middleton's outfits were inspired by the Duchess of Windsor. And uh, she has, in every sense, in the last year or two, come very much into the forefront of people's minds. And so she has become, again, a kind of style icon and, and a person whose position and plight and, and place in history and whose motives and things have all been re-examined. And on the whole, I think she's coming out a bit better these days than she did beforehand. Although we don't have it on view every day, it is something that through our programming we're able to bring out and share with the public and of course make available if there are special requests. Mm -hmm. I would say the monkey dress along with some other things in the collection are the most popular objects that are requested and I think last year I probably brought the monkey dress out about 10 times. Mm -hmm. So it is a known and very iconic object in our collection. What's the deal with the monkeys? Why monkeys? I think it was a whimsical reference to German porcelain monkey bands that probably she was familiar with. And it was something that would make her stand out. So I think it was something that's drawing your attention. I'm sure when she wore this dress, everyone was asking her why monkeys or what do the monkeys mean? So she was very good at getting attention through her clothing. It was considered funny too, it was humorous. Um, in the 20th century, they had bands of frogs playing animals, but in the 18th and 19th century it was bands of monkeys, and each monkey would play a different instrument. So every monkey on this dress is playing a different instrument. So here's a monkey with a wind instrument, you have a monkey with um, castanets. A drumming monkey. A drumming mm -hmm. monkey. Every monkey has a slightly different expression, and what I, I admire about the Duchess's sense of style is that it was a very classic style in the sense that it was 
very meticulous tailoring, very form-fitting clothing, but there's always a bit of whimsy in what she wore. And I think you see that the more you look at her clothing, that although the lines are very streamlined, um, the tailoring's meticulous, the fabrics are very uh, elegant and simple, um, there's always just that touch that would mm -hmm. make her memorable. And from the very moment she met the Duke and she appeared at court, she appeared in lilac and green, which were atypical colors for a woman appearing in court to wear at that time, and it caught his eye. So she knew how to make her fashion memorable, and mm -hmm. that was something she, even before she was with the Duke, when you look at early photos of her, she had a tremendous sense of style, and she knew how to make herself look fabulous. Do you think that she also took on a, a big lead in fashion? Because after all, they were kind of, even though they weren't king and queen of England, they wound up becoming king and queen of society. I guess she had a huge responsibility to live up to. Does that make sense? Or? I, think, I think she certainly did, and they made an enormous number of public appearances. So this, this was not a private life. This was not a life where people, where you could wear whatever you wanted. This is a life where people are recording what you wear, people are looking at you. Mm -hmm. I think she was under probably even greater scrutiny because she wasn't a royal by definition, right. and mm -hmm. she had always paid great attention to every detail of her appearance. Her hairstyles mm -hmm. were designed. She would get sketches of her hairstyles before they were done. But the Duke was the same way. Um, mm -hmm. So she dressed like royalty. So do you think that she may have actually been in competition with her in-laws? Oh, I think she was probably much more stylish than mm -hmm. any of the royals She was ahead the of them. Yes. She, was, she was ahead of them, but she also had the freedom to patronize the designers she wanted to patronize. Mm -hmm. Did clothing manufacturers copy this dress? I don't know of any copies, but certainly in the 60s, which is when this dress dates to, you do see monkeys in prints. Best fashion is always copied. It right? is always yes. copied, although um, not, not to the extent that it is now. But I would assume a lot of women probably ca you know, copied her style. They copied her style. Yes. I, th I think it was very much, um, she was featured in Vogue often, and she certainly was photographed extensively. I mean, she was not significantly different than, you know, everyone wants to see what Kate Middleton wore when she took her tour of the U.S. Um, people wanted to know what Wallace was wearing. Mm -hmm. And why did they want to know? Because of her celebrity and also the scandal, the abdication, but also because she, in their, her own right, was an inspiration for women. I mean, my Aunt Cora always wore Windsor nail polish. It was named after her, the Duchess of Windsor. It was a beautiful shade of dusty rose. So when she endorsed a product, people sat up and took notice. Mrs. Simpson always uh, was very funny and sharp and full of wisecracks. And I remember Lady Diana Cooper saying that the room sharpened up when she came in. She brought the best out of people. And I think it was just, she just had that natural sense of humor that she always kind of thought of the the right thing to say to cap a story or whatever. Um, the famous lines, of course, about you can, you know, you can never be too rich or too thin is, is well known. Um, I rather like the story that she, uh, she said when she was quite old and she was having dinner in Paris and she said, people are always telling me I should look up my old friends. Look them up, dig them up. If you don't have anything so nice to say about someone, say they were a great dancer and she was a great dancer. What is really interesting about um, Mrs. Simpson, of course, and, and the things that people have s said about her at the time of the abdication, during their lifetime, and even worse, after her death, is that, of course, if you get involved in a big drama like the abdication, the most dreadful things are going to be said about you. But she has been accused of possibly being a man, uh, which is total rubbish, as anyone um, who looked after her, nursed her, could have told and could have squashed, squashed that immediately. Um, they, they, they say she was a, a Nazi sympathizer. Uh, I don't think that's the case either. They say that um, you know, she was mistress of, of Ribbentrop and I don't know, lots of other people. Uh, again, all nonsense. Um, there's just nothing that they won't throw at the Duchess of Windsor to try to make her seem disreputable and they did it. Lots of people did it at the time. I mean, they were trying to blacken her name. Um, and uh, even, you know, quite serious and sensible civil servants working for the British government, you know, were coming out with these things. They suggested there was a, a China dossier, which uh, she'd learned all sorts of absurd sexual practices to capture the king in Shanghai when she was out there and so forth. 
Um, there's not a shred of evidence to, su to support any of these things, but they will always stick because mud sticks and mud sticks on a person who got involved in a big, in a big crisis and a big, in a big drama like the abdication. So it's very easy for the mud to stick. So it's a pity, pity. Um, and unfortunately, it is a sign of the times too that people who uh, get interested in these sort of figures like the Duchess of Windsor, on the whole, they kind of want dirt. They kind of don't perhaps even really care whether it's true or not. It makes a better story, which I think is a great shame. One of the most interesting things, Scott, uh, which no one would think of, you know, all the coronation souvenirs, all these books written about her. I have all these newspaper clippings. Uh, one thing is the CD of the FBI files on the Duke and Duchess. Oh my Williams. gosh, isn't that amazing? Wow. And if you look at it, uh, their are accusations of being Nazi sympathizers. In this, there are four letters written to J. Edgar Hoover, and they're handwritten. Two are anonymous. Two have return addresses. What you never hear about the, the letters is that they look like they were written by some one that's just neurotic. <laughs> and their misspellings, the grammar's terrible. It, it, it's, obviously by some idiot who, who wrote in these letters to J. Edgar Hoover accusing her and him of being Nazi spies and uh, they should be arrested. I wonder if they kept them on file for the protection of the Duke and Duchess of Windsor in case anything happened to them when they visited the country. Makes you wonder. J. Edgar Hoover had a reply for the two letters with return addresses. In effect, they said, thank you for your letter. There was no follow-up on anything. Mm -hmm. It was just, the only other thing in the file is the fact that uh, for the security of the Bahamas during World War II, as King Edward VIII right. be became Duke of Windsor and his brother George VI put him uh, in charge of the Bahamas as a governor general. He was granted by the FBI a tour of Quantico Mm -hmm. As the governor of the Bahamas. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. How did you that get all it. of these things? It was How all did... small supervised by the FBI and mm -hmm. Secret Service. How did I get all this stuff? Yeah, How did you acquire all this stuff? These are rare newspapers. I mean, Here. those are authentic, actual newspapers. Yeah. Some of these uh, I found at auction. Uh, some of them were, were donations. Mm -hmm. But they're very, very interesting to read. Mm -hmm. All this stuff by the... At, at that time, it's amazing. I mean, look at this one, say, King Determined to Wed, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. King Determined to Wed Wally. King yep. Determined to Wed Wally. And he did. He certainly did. The question should really be asked is, you know, what would have happened if he, if she hadn't gone to France and if she'd stayed around and uh, had managed to persuade him not to abdicate, which she might well have succeeded in doing. She always thought that, um, he was a man who'd known to have had several mistresses and girlfriends in the past and that her star would wane and at a certain point she'd probably go back to nice dull Mr. Simpson uh, with a few jewels to her credit. Um, and uh, I think Mr. Simpson wasn't so convinced that that was likely to happen, but it's interesting to think that she never thought that it would go much further. Had he stayed as king, some people suggest that he might have got away with marrying her at a later date. I'm not so sure that he could have done on account of the coronation oath and various other things. I think that they put forward a pretty strong case against this marriage. But it might have been that if he had established himself as king for a few more years, uh, perhaps quietly married her, as some other kings in history have done, uh, particularly abroad, um, he might have got away with it. But this is one of the big ifs of history. I. I think probably that it all turned out for the best, um, except maybe for the Windsors themselves. I'm not sure whether the life that they later on led will have made them particularly happy. Uh, I think that it's good advice to give any young people that if you have to make the choice between duty and happiness, choose duty because it'll always make you much happier in the long run. And they did the opposite. She commanded a respect um, similar, uh, 
I think she was perhaps supplanted by Jacqueline Kennedy, but she, uh, nothing was said against her. Uh, her appearance at a party ensured enormous attendance. Uh, you had to see what she was wearing. Uh, her lipstick was copied. Her nail polish was copied. I was very lucky to um, go over to the Duke of Windsor's house in 1972, shortly before he died, to see uh, his private secretary, and uh, somehow got tangled up in this story and got fascinated by both of them. I was already very, very interested. I'd read their, their memoirs and so forth. But very soon after that, the Duke died, and then uh, the Duchess fell ill, and nobody quite knew what was going on. The awful Metro Bloom sort of moved in and took control. And I kind of lived through all those years, talking to the private secretaries and hearing various conflicting stories about what was really happening and so forth. And then some years later, the Duchess's personal secretary was a, was a Swiss girl, a little bit older than me. She said to me, really, you should write this story and I will help you. And the main story I was writing was about what happened to the Duchess after the Duke died when she fell into the hands of her lawyer. But also to have another look at who was the Duchess and, and what, did she, what was she really like and, and what was she up to? Was she really the woman who stole the king? Was she a victim or was she a villain? And I think in the end she was a victim. And it's been very interesting in these last months since the book came out in London last April, going around and talking about her to audiences who you would think on the whole would be quite unsympathetic and had certainly been brought up to dislike the whole idea of her. They have begun to consider her in a different light, which has been very pleasing and I think is fair and correct. I think if you're looking for a villain, unfortunately it's him, not her. I think she certainly, oh, I think we might call her a gold digger and or, you know, socially, it, you know, she had her sights set very high. She set them very high. <laughs> of course, uh, the kings and queens of England have traditionally been buried uh, at Westminster Abbey and various other places. And since George III built the royal vault in St. George's Chapel, uh, St. George's Chapel Windsor has by and large been the place where the kings and queens of England are buried. There are 11 kings in St. George's Chapel, including King George V of Hanover, who was a, queen, a cousin of Queen Victoria's. Queen Victoria herself built a mausoleum at Frogmore, which is in the grounds of, of the castle, if you like, the, the home park. Um, Edward VIII did not know where, the Duke of Windsor didn't know where he was going to be buried. He contemplated being buried in France. I think I'm right in saying that James II is buried in France. And I think he thought for a time that he might be buried there. But he also decided at one point to buy a plot in Baltimore in Green Mount Cemetery. And he got his friend uh, Clarence Miles to investigate this and to purchase this plot. And that was going to be uh, another alternative. Actually, as early as 1961, it was decided that he would be uh, buried um, at Frogmore, where the, since 1928, there's been a, a private royal family burial ground, which is where his brother, the Duke of Kent, was buried and he actually in 1968 attended the the burial of Princess Marina and this very much uh, crystallized his wish to be buried there but of course there was one very important stipulation which was that the Duchess of Windsor should be buried with him at his side. As much as she was the girl from Baltimore she was the girl who had made it from Baltimore and she made it enormously and I think people smiled a bit when they saw her because they knew she had taken chances and she was daring and she had pulled it off. I've danced with a man who's danced with a girl.